first of all, with respect to the ruling, I think it bears emphasis that China's historical rights claims to the South China Sea have not been completely nullified. No? Their claim to islands and rocks still uh, um, remain. And the tribunal made it very clear that the ruling excludes consideration of whatever historic rights claims might, they might have all over those islands and rocks. No? Because historic rights claims can also be the basis for sovereignty claims. So the thing is, since sovereignty was expressly excluded from the case, the tribunal made it clear that it does not cover those questions. So if ever chi uh, China has historic rights, it will be limited both to only those areas. And up on the screen, you see basically the new map of the South China Sea post-arbitration. Okay. Those historic rights claims of China, if ever they are valid, uh, are limited to those spots, those circles uh, that you see there. Um, by implication, by the way, um, if the China does have valid historic rights claims to those islands and rocks, if they are above high tide level, then implicitly the territorial sea around them is also uh, included in those claims. However, um, these are again uh, not covered by the ruling. Um, so you could imagine that basically what has happened is that instead of a nine dash line, you have now, oh, I don't know how many, maybe 90 circles, uh, 90 circle lines <laughs> in the South China Sea. Um, and so that is the practical effect really of, uh, of the ruling on China's claims. So only the excessive maritime claims have been addressed. And they're excessive in the sense that they go beyond these potential uh, territorial seas around each island and rock. As a matter of law, the, the tribunals clearly stated that the Philippine EZ, and by implication, every, uh, everyone else's EZ, uh, basically trumps over any historic rights claims China may have had or, may, or might make in those areas uh, close to their coast, no? especially if it's covered by their, uh, EEZ, their EEZs. Historic rights, after all, are not uh, a matter of unilateral assertion by uh, any country, no? including China, especially if they're opposed by other countries, uh, against whom those historic rights are being asserted. And most uh, importantly, after UNCLOS, uh, as uh, Ian uh, emphasized earlier, the tribunal found that uh, China basically relinquished any historic rights claims it might have had to those waters when it signed the Okay. Now, one important point probably we need to also emphasize is that these historic rights claims of China have been characterized by quite a lot of ambiguity and inconsistency over time. And one of the biggest problems that academics have had uh, in characterizing China's rights has always been the lack of clarity about exactly what China was claiming in the South China Sea. Well, first of all, uh, the tribunal's ruling uh, has, has laid down clearly that ambiguity and inconsistency in positions over time is definitely not a source of any kind of rights that you can assert against others. And in this sense, in the analysis of the tribunal, that ambiguity and inconsistency has actually led the tribunal to uh, um, analyze it on its own and give its own interpretation of the nine dash line and whatever China was claiming within the nine dash line. And in the end, the tribunal found that uh, this, this kind of, of claims are simply inconsistent with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, the very important uh, aspect of the ruling is that um, excessive coercive unilateral maritime assertion activities, sometimes characterized as maritime coercion activities, have clearly been rebuked as illegal and contrary to international law. These include all of the um, assertion activities that uh, China has been undertaking, uh, undertaking since 2007, I believe, that include blocking and intimidation of smaller uh, vessels of the Southeast Asian nations, displacement of non-Chinese fishermen from their traditional fishing grounds or from common fishing grounds, as well as from their own EEZ, the um, construction of artificial islands 
and interference with petroleum exploration activities being conducted by these countries in their own continental shelf. The, the kinds, the methods employed by China um, um, that were um, subject to, to the case are basically the same kinds of methods they're employing against Vietnam and Malaysia, uh, as well as Indonesia when it comes to fishing and petroleum uh, activities especially. These have been declared to be clearly inconsistent with international law. And that means that if these activities continue, China will also be clearly acting against international law and will clearly be internationally responsible for any consequences that arise from those incidents, regardless of how they may uh, uh, describe <laughs> the situation. Okay. Now this um, um, excessive um, um, unilateralism, these excessive maritime activities have all, that also result in massive and permanent damage to the marine environment have also been clearly rebuked. I think this is a case uh, of uh, the tribunal really um, um, repudiating the unilateralism that has been employed, you know, the use of raw power and maritime coercion, which is really uh, symbolized uh, perfectly by the island building activities that China undertook. Okay. Now, of course, we, uh, we still have the same, many of the same challenges, uh, particularly since the disputes, the sovereignty disputes over those spots continue. Okay. So those territorial enclaves can still be the basis of future incidents and future problems. Mind you, each territorial enclave around one island or one rock is basically the size, uh, covers an area that is twice the size of Metro Manila. So you can imagine how huge it is. Um, and within these areas, since it is excluded from the, the, um, um, the, the, the case, you know, as so because they are sovereignty disputes, all parties are still basically free to undertake whatever activities they might uh, wish, subject to only two principal limitations. One is that such activities must not aggravate or extend the disputes. So, for example, further island building um, would be clearly uh, in violation of international obligations, even if these are inside these sovereignty dispute areas. Second limitation is that they must not harm the marine environment or, or, um, uh, or cause massive damage and prejudice to the rights of the parties. So these two limitations, at least, I think, would act as hopefully as moderating uh, uh, forces against further, uh, uh, well, whatever future steps the countries will take within their respective areas. Now, let me um, also, uh, for the second part of my talk, let me just um, respond briefly to China's post-arbitration objections, which have also been circulating in the media. Um, Particularly in the within the first week, uh, there was really a massive and, and mm, vociferous attack, really, on the tribunal's ruling and the tribunal itself, which unfortunately does not do well for China's reputation either. Now, it has objected, stated uh, that, for example, the tribunal is not part of the Permanent Court of Arbitration or the United Nations or the International Tribunal Law of the Sea or the ICJ or whatever. All of these objections are irrelevant because there are many tribunals, international tribunals, that are not part of any of these bodies. They exist independently. In fact, that's the whole point. It is an ad hoc arbitral tribunal under Annex 7. It derives its power and authority from that fact. Um, second uh, objection is that China has been asserting that um, the ruling is quote unquote null and void. There is no provision in international law for a ruling to be declared null and void unilaterally by one party. Now, consider that if any one country could declare a legal concept null and void simply by saying so, no? then we should probably remember that Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines previously declared the nine dash line null and void even before this ruling. So that argument really, 
does not hold water. Pardon the pun. Um, Annex 7 arbitral tribunals and their judgments, uh, as UNCLOS states, are legally binding on the parties. And there is nothing that China can do to um, 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 avoid this. Okay. Now, there has been, of course, some discussion about the possibility that some judgments could be null and void. And there are only two that have come to mind. One is if both parties agreed to turn the judgment, null, make the judgment null and void. Okay. Second possibility is if the tribunal's judgment was attended somehow by corruption. Okay. And that is probably why China turned to its third objection of um, um, attacking the integrity the, and even the race of the, tri the, the judges of the tribunal alleging bribery and some such. Now, of course, some of these objections really are not, uh, in a way, not worthy of, of discussion at all. But let me just point out, let's just point out that China had every opportunity to join the arbitration, appoint their own arbitrators, to influence the, co the membership of the arbitral panel. Yeah. And it did not take such opportunities, despite the constant invitations of the tribunal itself to do so. And if you look at the tribunal's uh, award and jurisdiction and admissibility, for example, they make it very, very clear you know, that they have given China every possible opportunity. Every communication has been uh, transmitted to China. And everything has been very transparent to the, with respect to the two parties. Now, on these charges of bribery, well, there has been the objection that perhaps money was passed because the Philippines paid for the arbitral panel uh, in its operations, paid for the whole proceedings. Well, of course, you had to pay for it because this is, you can't get anything for free in this world after all. But the point is that China also had the duty to contribute to the expenses of this arbitration and by its non-participation forced the Philippines to take up its share. It cannot now complain about the Philippines having paid the arbitral panel or its operations. Now, as for the rest, whether there is bribery, the Philippine government, as I understand it, I have spoken with the sol former Solicitor General, they're very uh, well prepared to uh, produce all of the financial documentation, all the receipts, so that everybody can uh, make their own uh, judgments. As for the, the objection that it is a U.S. conspiracy, <laughs> it seems like everything is a U.S. conspiracy these days. Um, for us in the Philippines, this is actually rather a bit disappointing because it smacks of stereotyping and racism. Yeah. If ever there was a conspiracy here, it was a purely Filipino conspiracy. Okay. And I think that it really, um, it's really quite uh, unfortunate that, the, that uh, China does not believe that uh, the Philippines does not have its own wellspring of legal talent that can actually design, conceive of, and design a case that can uh, win. As for the, uh, um, ah, okay. So let us go now to the impacts and implications of the ruling. Now, I want to talk about this externally, uh, meaning uh, apart from the issues between China and the Philippines. Now, of course, we've been say, uh, we've, there's been a lot of talk about the lack of an enforcement mechanism, that one party considers it non-binding or a mere scrap of paper. Well, those are issues between the Philippines and China. But let's talk about the actual effect of the ruling beyond the two parties. First of all, if we look, uh, take a step back, the ruling actually, uh, in general, determines what is right and wrong in the South China Sea. What is right and wrong in claiming rights and entitlements in the South China Sea. And this kind of declaration does not concern only the Philippines and China, but also everyone else who has an interest or uses the South China Sea. Ch um, it has been said, uh, especially in, uh, by, by my Taiwanese and, and Chinese colleagues, that the South China Sea situation has only become more complicated 
because of this ruling. And I agree, except that it has only become more complicated for China, not for the Southeast Asian nations. Why? Because the complication arises from the fact that China will continue to insist on what has been clearly declared to be an illegitimate claim and will continue to disregard their neighbors' rights and, and assert exclusive rights on uh, to resources which have already been agreed under international law to belong to the smaller uh, littoral states. Now, the ruling also has practical impacts on the various possible activities that China might undertake from now on, whether it's in the what, um, best case scenario, worst case scenario, the doomsday scenario, you should have a doomsday scenario. <laughs> okay, now for example, the declaration of air defense identification zone. If we look at the ruling, there is an, where it discusses the nature of Chinese activities in building up these uh, artificial islands. The tribunal refused to characterize them as military activities. Why? On the basis of China's own declaration, own claims that those islands are not military in nature and that they're there to provide public goods. Okay. The declaration, I argue, of an ADIS around these islands, therefore, would be contrary to that position because an air defense identification zone is something for military, uh, something that has a military purpose. And therefore, if they declare an ADIS around these islands, then they're clearly admitting that they have military purposes. A blockade of um, um, Philippine supply ships to uh, Sierra Madre and any of the other islands. The thing there is that with the declaration uh, of the, um, or, or rather the reduction of the area of legitimate disputes to only those um, um, enclaves around there, any activity that China undertakes to blockade transportation between those areas would clearly also be inconsistent with, its inter with, it, with international law, basically illegal, and therefore Philippines, for example, or any other nation who's trying to do this, could legitimately claim that China is acting illegally and perhaps even aggressively. And that would bring in uh, quite a number of uh, possible um, um, scenarios. But you could say that ultimately, the country attempting to resupply those areas and China uh, would be, mm, could legitimately claim that it is the one acting lawfully and therefore could take action to defend itself. Now, now of course, that is a rather you know, troubling uh, possibility. Uh, as for further reclamation, for example, of Scarborough Shoal uh, or any of the other features there, clearly this would tend to aggravate the dispute and prejudice the rights of parties and cause further massive damage to the marine environment. And therefore, since the tribunal has already said that these are illegal and consistent with China's obligations international law, they could also be, uh, uh, there's no escaping basically the fact that these would also be uh, illegal. Okay. Now, next point. Um, oh, because these are illegal activities, no, um, uh, since we now have a clear idea of what is right and wrong, what is legitimate and illegitimate, uh, what is um, a legal or illegal activity in the South China Sea. It also establishes very clearly the international responsibility of China for any of its maritime assertion and coercion activities from now on. The use of its law enforcement vessels in a dangerous manner against other states, unilateral actions, uh, other unilateral actions that, that uh, aggravate the dispute, such as, well, if they deploy the oil rig again, for example, to conduct drilling unilaterally in somebody else's uh, continental shelf or if they conduct more artificial island building. These would all kick in or, or engage China's international responsibility and could expose China's other commercial interests abroad to reprisals or other kinds of sanctions. For example, if China continues to protect Chinese fishing in other states' EEZs, then this could be characterized as state-sponsored IUU fishing. Okay. And therefore, any of these Southeast Asian nations would be well within their rights to try to lobby with the markets of Chinese fishery products and have them excluded uh, therefrom. Okay. Now, so I, I'm, I'm actually still studying the other possibilities for the, all the other commercial activities. 
So even if China considers this as null and void and non-binding on them, it cannot avoid the actual effects that they might have with respect to other parties. Now, third is that this ruling also has implications on security alliances and partnerships in, within the region. So for, for example, between Philippines and US under the MDT, and strategic partnerships, say, that are developing between Vietnam, uh, even Malaysia, US, Indonesia, etc. cetera. Um, the, 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 the fact that the tribunal has laid out what is legitimate or illegitimate within the South China Sea and where, no, um, this actually allows, um, or, or rather places these uh, Southeast Asian nations at a higher, uh, at, the, at the moral or legal high ground whenever they encounter these kinds of activities. And they can now um, take more, um, or po possibly they can invoke uh, these uh, alliances and partnerships really, to try to ensure uh, that they're able to protect whatever rights uh, they might have, rights and entitlements they might have that are being interfered in uh, by China. Okay. As for ASEAN, uh, yes, we're still waiting for any kind of joint statement. Personally, I don't hold my breath for that. In fact, I would be surprised if there was a joint statement. But I think this also indicates that uh, we might see another development, and that is the formation of what I would call an ASEAN maritime bloc composed of the South China Sea littoral states. After all, this is not, um, um, there is no obstacle to the formation of a, such a bloc if these countries decide that certain specific interests need to have some kind of special uh, grouping. For, uh, and this, is would not, this would not be unusual. We've seen trilateral uh, um, um, partnerships, for example, between Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, around the Straits of, uh, around the Straits of Malacca. We've seen the announcement of a Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia uh, cooperation uh, concerning uh, sea lines of communication between them, particularly in order to address the Abu Sayyaf group and terrorist operations. So it would not be a long stretch to have a similar kind of arrangement concerning uh, the South China Sea, especially since the ruling now provides them with what they've long needed, the um, a validation of their respective individual approaches as to how on how the South China Sea's uh, jurisdiction in the South China Sea should be divided. So what would be the way forward? Yes, it's very difficult right now. And I actually, I hesitate to, to make any kind of statement given that the president might, some, may, might say something uh, in the afternoon, which co completely changes everything. I have to wait for that. However, I think that really the way forward is, is going to be characterized by, the, by one, in order to move forward, both parties must agree to unconditional talks. And the initial objective is not really to enforce the ruling or, or secure compliance, but to simply bring down the temperature, bring down the tensions. That is clearly a priority. Uh, after that is done, then you can probably uh, say, that the parties can figure out, hopefully mutually, what would be the way forward for their respective, their relationships with each other. In the meantime, that does not prevent the Philippines, of course, from continuing on its own efforts to build up uh, cooperation, say, with the South Asia, Southeast Asian uh, countries, the ASEAN maritime bloc that I mentioned, or its um, security alliances and partnerships. That is not um, prevented, and in fact, it actually still is necessary until the disputes are ultimately resolved and until the two parties finally come to some kind of arrangement as to what happens uh, with this ruling. So um, other than that, right now, I guess we still have to wait until this afternoon <laughs> before we can uh, tell any more. I think with that, we can probably open up for discussions. Thank you very much.